Welcome to the Power Blog site. It is April 28th, 2012. This evening we have probably the most important video we've done in a long time covering uh, the Fukushima disaster and the fallout that's rained out on our country. Uh, this evening we'll show you the proof of long half-life radioactive material coming down in the rain and why you should stay out of the rain and how this fallout is being hidden by uh, people in academia and otherwise who uh, basically try to confuse people with uh, calling uh, non-detects and non-identifications as being uh, a lack of existence of the fallout. And we'll show you here pretty conclusively long half-life fallout. So I ask that you watch closely. We'll uh, keep it relatively simple, but uh, Please spread this video far and wide so that people can understand what's going on, can ask questions of uh, people who are trying to pull the wool over their eyes, and then provide us with any information that they find out. And that's one of the key reasons we share our information is because we want feedback from others to provide us with information we can use too. So uh, tonight what we'll show you is the April uh, 14th radioactive fallout event. This was uh, 49 times uh, greater than background radiation. Again, fell on April 14th. So, what we did was, is we took this radioactive material and we put it in our lab. And if you see here, here's an example of our lab. I mean, we strive for continuous improvement, so we're constantly adding more shielding. But what you'll see here is uh, two Geiger counters, two very closely matched Geiger counters, very sensitive in a lead cave inside a lead lined box. Uh, one Geiger counter has the uh, sample in it, and the other Geiger counter has the uh, control, which is uh, not a sample just a blank sample. So these two items are as closely matched as possible. Now what we do is we take those two readings, the one from the sample and one from the background radiation, and we subtract them from each other and we get this chart. In this chart, and it's a close-up of the longer half-life radioactivity, this chart shows results of the radioactive sample subtracted from the radioactive background. Here's the key thing. Here's the zero line. You can see the weight of this chart is above zero. Now the reason there's some negative values is because at any particular instant the Geiger counters might be reading slightly different things. But over time they are virtually identical in what they read in the background. And I'll show you the proof of that. Here is the reading and basically what we did was is after we took the samples and we read the samples in our lead cave we set these Geiger counters back into the lead cave with no samples in them and just took readings of the background and this is Geiger counter number one and notice how the values are centered around the uh, 0.4 counts per second line and if you look here this is the average counts per second of uh, this Geiger counter over this time period. And this is a two day reading. Two days we ran this. Average counts per second for Geiger counter number one. This is the average Geiger counts per second for Geiger counter number two. This is the difference between those two readings. 0 0.000562 counts per second. It comes out to over one hour time period in these two days these Geiger counters are, are show a difference of two counts per hour difference on average. So these Geiger counters are extremely closely matched and we went through a lot of trouble to make sure that they are. We spent a lot of money to make sure we were doing this right. Now this is Geiger counter number one. Now what I'll show you is we'll flip over to Geiger counter number two. And again, here let me I'm going to flip back and forth a couple of times. So you can see at any particular instant the individual peaks vary. But if you'll notice they're constantly leveled around that 0.04 line. 
So these Geiger counters are almost identically matched. They are a match set in a lead cave measuring almost exactly the same background reading over time. And we'll go down here and we'll show you the time period this was run over. We ran this test from April 21st through April 23rd. Two Geiger counters sitting in the cave with nothing in them except just measuring background. And we ran this test immediately, immediately after we took these measurements from the, uh, the sample minus the uh, background radiation. So there, what we show is, is that we have an actual long-term detection of long half-life radioactivity. And we've modeled it. I'll show you another Excel chart here. Now this is our model of the radioactivity. Now we can't be 100% certain of what all these of what these materials actually are, but they fit in line with these half-lives. Now, the first ones are the short half-life elements. Six counts per second, lead, bismuth, often called uh, radon daughters or radon progeny. And what we've noticed out of Fukushima is when the short half-life radiation is very high, and we've documented this, that it indicates that there will be a report out of Japan of recriticality within usually a week or two measured in the sludge pits and everywhere else in Japan. So we've got a strong correlation between short half-life radiation and uh, recriticality in Japan. Now where we believe this comes from, and pay closely attention to this because this is very often misrepresented by people who claim to be scientists. We believe that radon daughters and radon progeny are being steamed out of the ground in Fukushima. Now, Japan has naturally highly has naturally radioactive natural radioactive elements in the groundwater. Those elements get even greater during uh, earthquakes. So as they build up, we get a recriticality. They steam out. We pick them up here in, Fukush in uh, the United States and they're the canary in the coal mine that let us know when this longer half-life uh, radioactive materials are in here. Now, if you look at this value, 0 .0, 0.2 counts per second. Basically what we've got going on here is uh, 1.3 counts per minute of some unknown radioactive material. That, uh, with some combination of beta and gamma. It could be a various combination of things. It could be a pure gamma emitter. We don't know. Now the way we model this to get this fit so closely, and what you'll see here, there are actually two line, there are actually two fits in here. There's a uh, the actual data, which is in green, and it's in the background. Let me pull it to the foreground. Select data. Put the data. So let's see if this brings it up. Okay. So the real data is in green. So we'll see how this fits around and is bounded on either side by the blue data. Now the key is, is we are trying to identify it here, give some idea of what's going on, and this is as a double check. But we can't say for certain it's cesium-134. What we do is, is we model the fallout. And we have a very detailed model here where we build the radioactive uh, decay curves of various elements and model them against the the real detection and include the appropriate noise for uh, the Geiger counters and we compare the two and what we get is a pretty close fit here but again the key is is this sample on average is above zero now, here's where the scam comes in from the people who, who uh, the scientific institutions and the academic institutions and those people on the internet who self-identify themselves as scientists. They try to confuse people by, uh, showing by showing tests they do, typically with gamma spectrometry. 
and they say, well, we can't identify anything. Therefore, it's not in there. Now, that's the trick. We can't identify it, therefore it's not in there. That's not how it works. The Fukushima is a long-term scenario with continuous bombardment of fallout. It builds up over time. Some of the stuff can't easily be detected by gamma spectrometry, especially if it's short half-life stuff that comes down at the same time as the uh, uh, potential radon daughters. Now, the better scientists out there, the ones who do it for a living, the ones who stick to their credibility and know what they're doing but are probably misleading the public, what they do is, is they'll give the gamma spectrometry and they'll say, our no detect level is you know, so many becquerels. Well, in essence, what they're doing is, is they're going out there and they've got a range ga a rain gauge that's a five gallon bucket, let's say. And so, that's the lowest they can measure, is with their five gallon bucket. So if they set their five gallon bucket out in the rain, and then after the rainstorm's over, if they go outside and they see that their five gallon bucket is full of five gallons of water, then they say, ah, we have a detection of rain. Yes, we can verify there's rain. Now, if the bucket is half full, if it's only got two and a half gallons of water in it, then they go, well, it's really a non-detect because our detection levels are at five gallons, but you know, there might be something in there. There might not be anything in there. Now, if it's an inch of water in that five gallon bucket, say just a half a pint at the bottom, then they'll say, ah, there's no rain. There's no rain. We can conclusively say we have not identified any rain at all. Well, how many one inch rains do you have to get from a disaster that continues for maybe the next 20 years before you have a flood and they've told you they've not detected anything at all. Now, there are other hacks on the internet who claim scientific backgrounds. And for whatever reason, they won't tell you what their non-detection limits are. Either they don't know how to do it or they don't understand it. My guess has been is that these are people who know how to turn on their machines and can fiddle with them but uh, they can't produce reliable results and quantify it they can qualify but they can't quantify so what they say is oh we haven't been able to detect anything we haven't been able to identify cesium-134 therefore it's not in the rain now, notice the difference between that and what we're doing here. We're taking a measurement of the radioactivity of the rain and of the background and comparing them to see if there's a difference between the two. If there's a difference, then there's something there. Now, we can't 100% say exactly what it is. We can have some idea, but we can't say for certain what it is. But it is there. Now, opposed to that, to people who don't run their who don't have the knowledge to identify what their control limits are and don't run their gamma spectrometry long enough and don't have it fine-tuned enough that they can actually determine if it's there or not there but because they say they can't identify it they claim or they state well it's not there now here's the rub and we can get a motive for some of these people obviously there are people in the industry who are trying to defend the industry and they may not want people to know the whole truth and they might rationalize it by saying well the stuff's not dangerous there's other people on the internet hacks who we believe they're striving for credibility and you don't get credibility in that industry by disagreeing with the industry you get credibility by reassuring people and by oh don't be scared yeah. People are trying to influence on the internet. We're the only site on the internet that we're aware of that we're not trying to influence anyone as to what they believe. We're just trying to collect data so we get a better understanding of risk mitigation, of what we can do to protect our family. 
we share our information with you so you can go out and find information and share it back with us but don't let anybody tell you that it's not coming down because if you see here it is coming down it is there they may not be able to identify it and if you're out in the rain when this stuff comes down you're absorbing it some of the stuff might be more dangerous than the other stuff but stay out of the rain you do not want this on you we don't want it on us share the information if somebody tells you that they can't identify it so that's not there ask them what their no detection limits are ask them how they calculated their no detection limits yeah, what would be interesting is if uh, somebody set up dueling gamma spectrometry in dual close lead caves and tried to do the same experiment. But you'd have to have really high-end equipment to do that. It's not easy to do it well with cheap equipment, especially when you're just measuring in five-gallon buckets to make your identification and the stuff's coming down one inch at a time. This stuff, this nightmare is going to continue for a long time. Take cost-effective risk mitigation measures. Somebody tries to convince you it's safe and they're wrong, you'll pay for that. Walk on the safe side. Take risk mitigation measures that are not expensive. Simple things. But share the knowledge and don't let them con you. Good evening.